Well, I've been so excited to share this series with you. I certainly never imagined that it would be um, via video. I think if I can remember, the only other time that I really preached to, to a camera was on the day that Benjamin, my oldest son, was born. Uh, turns out the day he decided to arrive was on a Sunday. Go figure. So five o'clock in the morning, as I'm about to go to church, uh, things start happening uh, with Kristen. And so we rush off to the hospital. And so it turns out we were just that day launching a 30-week sermon series through the book of Mark. So I kind of felt like I really needed to do that. So preach that to a camera. And that went out to the, to the later services. So I, I, don't, I don't really remember what I said. I don't think I made much sense. Um, so I kind of hope that today that it will make uh, a little bit of sense. So I've got to be honest, it is a little bit weird. I'm thankful there's some staff members here. Uh, thank you, guys. You're going to have to, like, your amens will have to be the amens of like hundreds to help us happen. Thank you. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about where the idea for this series comes from. Uh, well, I mean, part of it is because you're really trying to build towards Easter, which is just like hands down my, my favorite time of the year. But the, the other, the kind of the design of the series, especially the kind of but why emphasis comes from a conversation that I had from a, a very good friend of mine back in 2004. So when the Passion of the Christ movie uh, with Mel Gibson was first released, there was kind of a, a lot of, I suppose, if you remember, some excitement at the time, at the opportunity for this movie to really engage with people. So this friend of mine um, wa was not a Christian. In fact, he was very aggressively against Christianity. And of course, he knew that I was a Christian. And we kind of just had this uh, sort of understanding that I would never talk to him about Christianity, and he wouldn't talk against it, and then we'd still manage to be friends. And when the Passion of the Christ movie came out, uh, I, I remember just like on a whim, just inviting him, you know, maybe, and, and he decided to come. So I was super excited about that in the movie theater uh, with a couple of other people that weren't Christian at the time and just kind of watching the movie and seeing this like hectic you know, description of the death of Jesus and the whole time just thinking, this is it, man, this guy, he's going to get it. He's gonna, surely he's going to become a Christian. And so the movie ended and we were kind of walking out of the cinema and, I, and I'll never forget exactly where we were. And I was kind of really nervous. And I turned to him and tentatively asked, you know, so, you know, like, what did you think? And uh, his, his answer to me was, was, yeah, I mean, I, I get it. Like Jesus, that, that it was real and that he died this really gruesome death. And I'm like, I'm thinking in my mind, angels are poised about to blow their trumpets and have party, right? This is it. But then he said, but, he said, but why? Why did that have to happen? Why did this man Jesus, why did he have to die such a gruesome death? Which is what kind of the whole movie is about. And I said, well, you know, Jesus died for our sins. That's the right answer, hey? Guys, yeah, meant absolutely. I mean, that's in the Bible. It's exactly in the verse that we're reading today. Christ died for our sins. That's what I told him. And he said to me, yes, but why? Why did he have to die? And why did it have to be so gruesome? And he says, I guess that there's this thing called forgiveness but like, why did it have to involve death? And why did it have to be you know, such a gruesome death? And that I couldn't answer. And so I went home and, and like I made it my mission to be able to answer that question. And, and to this day, I'll, I'll say that I'm still to this day discovering just how that one question, but why, just unlocks so much about who we are, who God is, how he relates to us, and his specific purposes for us. And so that's the purpose of the series, to go through just some of these answers to exactly why the crucifixion of Jesus happened in the way that it did. So for today, today's title is really simple, and design is like the best way to start this series. Why did Jesus die? One of the answers to that question, a beautiful, simple answer is to show God's love for us. So check out our passage for today. 
is Romans 5, verse 6 to 8. And it says this, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so this passage is making clear that the death of Jesus is God showing his love for us. Now there's a lot more to the death of Jesus than that, and that's what the series is about, but part of it, a beautiful part is the reason Jesus died and died that kind of death is because God wanted to show us that he loves us. And just kind of by the way, that word God shows is in the present tense. So the cross is an event of the past, but it keeps showing us the love of God. It's supposed to still show us today the love of God. Now, if we're really going to understand this and really get why the cross shows the love of God, then we've got to embrace the spirit of the series, which means we've got to ask one question, which is what, guys? But why, right? But why? Why does the death of Jesus on a cross show? How does the crucifixion event show the unparalleled love of God? I mean, think about it. If God wanted to show me that he loves me, he could have just decided to like buy me a Ferrari, right? And I would have been like, hey, I mean, thank you. Uh, that would have been imp an impressive for me, display that he loves me. So how does the death of Jesus on a cross show in an unparalleled way that God loves me? Well, I'm glad you asked. So, so we're going to explore today. You can evaluate the measure to which somebody loves something or someone by assessing two things. One the magnitude that they would sacrifice for the recipient of their love. So, I mean, even in, in the kind of discussion of giving gifts as trying to display your love, if you had to evaluate how effective the gift was in showing love, you would kind of ask the question, well, how much did that gift cost? Or even go beyond that and say, how much did the person have to sacrifice to give that gift? So for in the example of the Ferrari, or in God giving a Ferrari, well, I mean, he owns the entire universe. God giving of, of a Ferrari is really no sacrifice to him. Uh, I mean, for example, if you have uh, a million rand in your bank account and you give me a thousand, I mean, I'm going to be, I'm going to be pretty grateful for that. Uh, but it's a different thing to if you have a thousand rand in your bank account and you give me all of that because you realize that I need it. That sacrifice is greater and it is a greater demonstration of the love that you have for me. So that's the one way to evaluate love is the magnitude that the person is willing to sacrifice on behalf of the recipient of their love. The second way that you can evaluate their love is by evaluating or assessing the merit or worthiness of the recipient of their love. So the simple version of that is this. If you were worthy of that gift... In other words, if you deserved that gift, then I would say that that gift is less of a gift as it is a reward. It's a reward. If you deserved it, if you're worthy of it, it's not really a gift. It's more like a reward, and then it's kind of more in the arena of a transaction than merely a gift. It's like at Christmas time, how... Um, parents just leverage the Father Christmas Santa Claus thing by going, you know, if you're really good, you're like, you got to be good, then, then you're going to, then you will get a gift. And kind of when the time comes, I mean, like whose kids are ever good? Like, not mine. And, and you still give them 
you still give them that gift. So this passage magnifies the love that God has for us by showing us the magnitude that he sacrificed for us and by showing us in some detail, mind you, just how unworthy we were as recipients and therefore how great the gift is and therefore just how much he loves us. Does that make sense? So, so let, me, let me show you that. So first let's have a look at how this passage shows us in some detail just how unworthy we were actually. So it's not a transaction, it's not a reward. It's a gift, so behind that is the love of God. So, so you, you cannot read this passage without really getting that Jesus did not die for us because we deserved it. In fact, this passage takes great pains to say that in fact we were completely unworthy. And you see that in the three words given to describe who we were as recipients of this gift. So here are the three words in the passage. We were weak, ungodly, sinners. That's how this passage describes us. Weak, ungodly, sinners. Right, where do you feel good on a, on a Sunday, right? At least if you're sitting at home, maybe you've got your bunny slippers on making you feel better, right? So the word weak, the word weak really isn't um, this idea of like physical weakness. It means literally helpless. While we were helpless, so unable, completely unable to do anything about our situation, helpless, so one of the things that kind of annoys me, you know, as a pastor and in Christianity, I'm sure for you guys as well, is when people kind of quote the Bible and so they, they have these phrases that they say that sound really wise and that they think are from the Bible, but they're not in the Bible. Like any of you think of some of them. One of them, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, is when, is when people will say, God helps those who help themselves. You guys heard that? God helps those who help themselves. What rubbish. God helps those who are completely helpless. While we were helpless, Christ died for us. God doesn't help those who help themselves. He helps the helpless, or, or maybe to put it more accurately, God helps those who realize that they are helpless and can't help themselves so we're weak secondly we are ungodly and you might have been sitting there going well helpless yeah i can identify with that i've, I've felt helpless we know what it means to be helpless especially right now but when it comes to ungodly you'd be like oh I mean, I don't really think I'm ungodly. I have my issues, but I'm not like, you know, perpetrating massive amounts of evil right now. So here's the thing. Uh, the word ungodly means to live as if God does not exist. And to be sure, when you live as if God does not exist, it results in perpetrating massive amounts of evil but if we're honest, even if we're not doing that, we live as though God does not exist. And it may not specifically manifest in evil, but it does manifest in other ways. For example, panic and fear. Like what a lot of people are experiencing right now. And, and I mean, I mean, guys, I hesitate to say this because this fear is real. But panic, as in uncontrolled fear, is often living as if God does not exist. Because if we really do believe that God exists, that He's all powerful that he really does love us, that he has the authority and the ability to actually intervene in our daily lives 
for our good, if we lived as though God existed, we wouldn't live in this kind of state of panic. So in, in a lot of ways, I think, we still live as ungodly people who live as though God does not exist. Third word used to describe us is the word, so helpless, ungodly, sinners. And again, that doesn't just like refer to like doing actual sinful deeds. Of course, it includes that. But the idea behind the word sin in the Bible is literally, literally the idea of missing the mark. As in I tried, like I, like I aimed for it, and then I missed it. And then I tried again, and I missed it again, and I tried and I missed again. Anyone identify with that? No Rosebank Union staff. Church, you need to know Rosebank Union staff. You know, <laughs> you know we all like, experience it all the time, like this consistent sense of, like I try and I try again and I try again, and I just keep missing the mark. So I believe those three words describe all of humanity, and they describe a situation as far removed from God as possible. In fact, if you go on to the next verse, we're actually going to get to this next week, verse 10, summarizes it by adding a fourth word, we are God's enemies. Helpless, ungodly, sinful enemies. And yet, despite this, Christ died for us. So how does the death of Jesus show in an unparalleled way the love of God? Or for one way, by showing us just how unworthy we are as recipients, and yet he still gave. So um, John Piper, who, who wrote a book called 50 Reasons Why Jesus Came to Die. We're doing 11 50 Reasons Why Jesus Came to Die. And by the way, you can download that for free. He says this. He says, I've heard it said, God didn't die for frogs. So therefore, he, he was responding to our value as humans. And he goes on to say this. This turns grace on its head. We are worse off than frogs. They have not sinned. They have not rebelled and treated God with the contempt of being inconsequential in their lives. God did not have to die for frogs. They aren't bad enough. We are. Our debt is so great and only a divine sacrifice could pay it. So at this point, if you're at home, maybe you're really holding on to your bunny slippers, right? Because it's just sounding really bad. Like I'm worse than... And a frog. So here's the good news. And I really believe that this is good news. The fact that Jesus died for us in our most unworthy state means we are completely secure in his love. If there was any hint in the Bible, and there is not even a hint, if there was any hint that Christ died for us because of anything good in us, then we would be driven to continuously do good things to earn the affection of God. And this passage is saying outright, you don't need to. If God only loves you when you are lovable, then what happens when you stop being lovable? What would happen to the love of God? What would you do then? So I want to emphasize something here. This verse says specifically, God shows his love for us, dot, 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 Christ died for us. And what I'm trying to point out here is that sometimes when we think about the love of God and we think about the Trinity, we're kind of tempted to, as we read our Bibles, kind of think of God the Father as the really angry one. And he's like constantly judgment and wrath and anger. And then you got Jesus, and he's a really nice one. He's the one like, who loves us. And I mean, to be sure, verses talk about the love of Jesus in dying for us as well. And even if sometimes we have this Trinitarian view of God, we still have this idea of Father and Son. It's kind of like God's kind of schizophrenic. 
So he's sometimes really angry, and then he's like sometimes loves us. And this verse is focused on if God shows his love, Christ died for us. It's showing us God loves us. Same as John 3 verse 16, the classic. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now the reason that I'm pointing this out to you is because I want you to know how comprehensive the love of God is. The point of this whole passage is to show us that there is no reason for God to love us apart from the fact that that's because that's who he is. So, it's two ways to measure love. One is by the magnitude or, or the worthiness of the recipient, which we just looked at, and the second is by the magnitude of the sacrifice. And I just want to be really quick here. We're going to journey through this right up to Easter. Let's focus on those last four, four words in this passage. Christ died, died for us. The horrific death by crucifixion that Christ endured, the reason it was so horrific, one of the reasons, it was so horrific, we'll get into other reasons later, but one of the reasons it was so horrific is to show us the magnitude of which God was willing to sacrifice and suffer for us on our behalf to show us that he loves us. That's what I should have said to my friend that day outside of the movies. It's like, why was it so gruesome? Well, may, many reasons, the magnitude of sin, we'll get into that. But one of them is, hey, man, that you could know just how much God loves you by how far he was willing to go to sacrifice for you. That's why. So what does this mean for us now? And so kind of as, as we end off, I just want to, Turn your attention to one other verse that specifically mentions this connection between the death of Christ and his love for us. Ephesians 5, verse 1 to 2 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It's very deliberately another passage about demonstrating love through sacrifice and offering. But it adds in these two things. Here's what that means for us. So first, walk in love. It means literally live. Go about your daily lives remembering and receiving and accepting this transformative love that God has for you. So let me go back to this frog thing because there's something that's just not quite resolved there. So I kind of use it because it's pr provocative and true in a way, but there's something else to talk about here. Sure, Christ didn't die for frogs because they didn't need him to do that, and we are weak, ungodly sinners, and frogs are not, sure, but where that quote talks about the connection between our value and kind of puts it aside. I want to say this. The death of Jesus does, in fact, show us how valued we are. Get this, this is important, but not because of any inherent value. It does show us just how valuable we are, but that valuable is not inherent. It's not in our own worthiness or goodness. But if you think about it, the value of something is never determined by its inherent worth. Okay, so I know it's kind of a complicated statement, but let me try to describe it like this. So, so one of the things you'll get to know about me at Rosebank Union Church is that I love coffee. And so there's a type of coffee out there uh, called Kope Luwak coffee. Some of you might know it, uh, which is a coffee bean that is processed, instead of being processed the usual way through splitting the fruit from the, from the bean, it is processed through the feces of a civet cat. Some of you guys know this, but literally they harvest these coffee beans by digging around in in the poop of this little animal. And then they roast that, and then they sell it to us as the greatest coffee in the world. And they sell it for a ton of money. Now, I've never, I've never tasted all that coffee. And I can tell you guys right now, I don't care for it. Don't be sending me that coffee. I'm not interested in coffee that has been 
processed in that way. And I really cannot believe for a second that that coffee is actually better than like a good old Kenyan bean. You know, but the fact that people are willing to pay 10 times the price for that coffee shows me that, hey, I may not believe that it is inherently better than. The fact that people are willing to pay more shows me actually that it is of higher value. Does that make sense? You know, I remember um, our youth pastor actually preaching on this, and uh, it was just so helpful for me. But he, he was saying, hey, he had kind of had a pencil and said, this pencil, like, what is the value of this pencil? So you might think, okay, um, so the value of it is what it costs to make the pencil, 50 cents. And some people might go, no, well, the value of the pencil is how much it's sold for in the shops, two rand fifty. And then, and then you kind of ask, so, so how much will you give me for that pencil? And someone shouted out, I still can't figure out if it was an audience plant or not, but someone shouted out 50 rand, which shows that the value of that pencil wasn't 50 cents, wasn't 2 rand 50, it was 50 rand. Why? Because that's the price someone was willing to pay for that pencil. The value of something is never determined by its inherent value. It is always determined by the price which someone is willing to pay for it. Like that really bad coffee, I'm sure. And so this Christ dying for us, that's where the frog thing goes a little bit wrong because actually, yes, actually it does show us just how valuable we are. Not inherent value, but the value that is now ascribed to us through this magnitude of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through this overwhelming display of his love, you should walk away feeling val it's valued and, worth and having worth, not self-worth, not self-worth, a worth that comes through accepting and realizing the love that God has for you. And I think that could change your whole life. And I'm really hoping that that's going to change some people's lives today. So walk in that. It's a life thing. The love that God has for you, not inherently, but because of how he dis displayed that to you. And then, and then so the second thing is, so walk in that and then be imitators of that same love. This is the challenge. Treat others the same. This, I'd say, is one of the great challenges of Christianity, to walk in God's love and to walk in a way that imitates God's love. And may you really help us to do that, especially at this time. Amen? So I want to pray. So let's pray kind of bow your heads where you are uh, in your homes and just as you as you bowing your heads and as I pray my hope for this prayer comes from the verse just before the one that we read which speaks about hope and says and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And Heavenly Father, our God, I pray today for all the people of Rosebank Union Church just gathered at different times and in different places we know that, that we're so connected to you by the death that you died for all of us and so connected to you even at the same time in a strange way through your Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would pour out your love. Pour out the love of God into our hearts. May people gathered across the city have an experience of the outpouring of your love even now. As we think about the magnitude of your sacrifice and as we think about our complete unworthiness to receive that gift, would you pour out your love on us and would it transform us in a way that we could walk and live in it, especially in these uncertain times?
And that especially in these uncertain times, we would be imitators of that same love. In Jesus' name. Amen.